Recordology. Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. Okay, this is going to be an interesting show for you guys, I hope. Um, I find this stuff completely fascinating, so bear with me. So, let's say it's 1990-something-ish, and you've got your Kenny G Miracles The Holiday Album tape out, and you're looking at it and you're thinking, man, I love physical media. I'm so glad that it's still the 90s and physical media still exists, and I don't have to worry about everything being non-tangible digital assets that take no discipline to to come across because we still have physical media and you come across this little symbol and you're like what the heck what is that hx pro bnr what the heck and there's that symbol again on the side or maybe you know that's dolby dolby noise reduction something that you don't see on compact discs is because you don't need it but on a compact cassette such as this you'll often find the Dolby logo. Sometimes it just says Dolby. Sometimes it'll say B. Sometimes it'll say C. Every once in a rare while, it'll say S. And sometimes you'll see HX Pro. What does it all mean? Well, if you're like most people, you realize, well, Dolby just makes it sound better. Well, yes and no. I actually have an opinion on that. But let's talk about facts. Let's talk about what it is, how it works. A lot of people say, well, yeah, it's just noise reduction. It rolls off the highs so that, you know, the hiss goes away. It's not as simple as that, yet it's not too complicated. So bear with me here as we take a little bit of a journey, okay? First, and while we have something visual to look at, I'm just going to flip through this so you have something to look at while I'm talking. Um, Dolby Laboratory, Kenny G. I don't know why this is the one that I happen to grab. I apologize. Nothing to do about Kenny G specifically. Although I like Kenny G. I think he's got good stuff. Oops. So, uh, Dolby Laboratories released their first noise reduction in 1965. It was called Dolby A. And you've never seen a tape with Dolby A because it was professional only. Dolby A was not for the consumer market. That came along in 1965. But later in 1968, if you remember, the compact cassette was still kind of only good for vocal use. It wasn't really a good music format by the late 60s. It was it had to do with tape formulation. It had to do with a lot of things. But one of the things that really helped bring the compact cassette into the mainstream in terms of sound quality was Dolby B, which was Dolby's first consumer format for noise reduction that came out in 1968 and that's kind of weird to think too that dolby goes back to the 60s then they came out with dolby c in 1980 and finally dolby s in 1989 and the last thing they came out with actually actually not the last thing the second to last thing they came out with was dolby sr which was their second professional noise reduction technique so you'll never see a dolby a tape or a dolby sr that was recording studio only. As far as consumers go, we knew B, C, and S. But it's rare to find an S tape. This was not an S tape. It's rare to find an S tape because with Dolby S coming out in 1989, it was killed off by the little format you might have heard of called compact disc. So as CDs came on the market with virtually no hiss whatsoever, you know, people were like, yeah, so you finally got a, a tape to sound good. Well, we got these new CDs. They have a bunch of other features. That being said, if you have a Dolby S deck, we reviewed one a year or so ago, you can actually get near CD fidelity by using metal tape. And tape type is a separate topic. We're not going to talk about that today. But if you use metal tape and uh, Dolby S, you can achieve compact disc quality audio. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how Dolby works. Yes, we're going to look at a chart. But if you're like me, you're visual, and this will actually truly, truly help. So this is actually a very, very simple chart. I've put my name on it so you know I made it. I didn't copy it off of the Internet. This is truly, truly unique to this channel. But it's not, it's not that complicated. This is very simple. And, of course, let me preface this for the experts and the engineers out there. This is going to be a very, very simplified explanation there's a lot of science that goes into the details surrounding this we're just talking about very rudimentary basics okay but it's all true so on this chart here or this graph we're going to show 
two things, volume or amplitude, which is represented on the left here. The higher up is the louder, the lower is the quieter. And frequency, the far left is the low frequency or low bass sounds, and the right is high frequency. Now this range, 20 hertz or 20 cycles to 20 kilohertz or 20,000 cycles is roughly the range of human hearing and it's also the range that, you know, speaker companies and headphone companies claim that their gear can, you know, reproduce, which is a separate topic for a second day. But let's t let's assume that this is going to represent what we're hearing on a cassette tape with and without Dolby. I'm going to go ahead and put this tape down here so we don't forget what we're talking about here. I'm going to use a couple of different colors. So, again, the higher is the volume, the left is low frequency or low bass sounds, and the right is higher frequencies, treble sounds like that. So when you're playing back a tape, and we're, this is going to be kind of like a spectrum analyzer. It shows, you know, little meters going up and down depending on the frequency, high and low and whatever. And uh, so that's another way to look at this. But if you're, let's say that this is a representation of audio on a cassette tape or reel-to-reel -reel tape or eight-track tape, any kind of magnetic tape, tape has hiss or noise. And if you were to chart that, it would look something like this. It happens in the higher domain on the frequency spectrum, and it gets louder the higher that frequency goes. And we, we don't like that hiss. You know, that sound is just like, oh. And that's inherent in magnetic tape recording. So what are you going to do about it? So Dolby is designed to make that go away. So how are you going to do it? You may say to yourself, well, easy, just turn the treble down and flatten that out. That is a good thought, but it creates a problem because... There is something called signal to noise ratio. And the signal to noise ratio looks like this. So let's say, again, it's going to be a simplification. It's going to be a simplification. But let's say that you have audio that you want in green. Kind of looks black on camera, but it's really green. So let's say this is the music that we're listening to. It's louder than the noise. And that gap is called your signal to noise ratio. And that signal to noise ratio is reliant on the frequency. It's gonna be less at higher frequencies when you're using analog media and greater at low frequencies. There's noise at all frequencies, but primarily we're talking about tape hiss, high frequency noise. So this gap isn't going to change. You can't change that gap by itself. So what would happen is if you were to roll off the treble to get, let's say we wanted to roll off the treble. So, okay, we're going to turn the treble down. And that line isn't going to go up here anymore. The line is going to go down. It's going to roll off. Well, that helps get rid of some of the hiss. The problem is because this is set in stone, it's going to follow suit. So we're going to lose those high frequencies that we want so that's the problem with that. And what would that sound like? Well, the hiss would go away, but it would sound muddy. We would lose those high frequencies that make up the spectrum of sound that we're used to hearing. Okay, so remember this. We can refer back to it if we need to. Well, it bled through a little bit. Sorry about that. It's a good thing I printed off more than I needed. But let's keep that in mind because we're going to draw the same, same scale again. So again... Sorry, as I shuffle Sharpies here. Our usable music sound that we want is represented here. Now, obviously, it's, again, simplified. In a real-world scenario, there's this is up and down, and, you know, it's much more dynamic. But the basic premise exists. And we still have that old, annoying tape hiss that's just always there. So how Dolby works is this. Knowing, back to this principle that these signal to noise ratio gaps are preset. They're essentially locked to each other at whatever value it is, depending on the frequency. That can actually be used to the advantage of getting rid of hiss. So how do they do it? See if you can guess if you have, I mean, if you know, you know, but think about if you have no idea how this works, think from a logical perspective, how would they do that? What they do is they ironically get rid of that high frequency 
at this level and boost it. They amplify the highs. You may be saying, why would they do that? Keeping in mind this principle here, these gaps are preset. And now, because the highs have been boosted, there's a bigger gap than there was before. Left to its own natural state, the gap, the signal to noise ratio gap was a lot smaller on the high frequencies where that annoying hiss represented in purple there was. But now that we've amplified in the recording, and that's an important thing too, Dolby noise reduction is a two-step thing. It's encoded and then decoded. So when you record in Dolby, you can then play back and decode that Dolby. It's a two-step process. So in the encoding phase, they amplify the high frequencies. And then what do you think happens when you play it back? So this is what a Dolby encoded tape has. So this Kenny G tape literally has an artificially boosted high frequency range. If you were to just to play it back without any Dolby noise reduction on a good deck, and I'll explain what I'm talking about in a minute, um, you're gonna hear it's really bright. It's really, the hits will still be there until you enact the uh, Dolby noise reduction, but just playing it back without the Dolby noise, you're gonna hear a lot of bright high end. It's gonna sound really harsh and really bright and really he treble heavy, if that makes any sense. So here's the magic. This is what I love. I wish I could animate this, but what happens is this. I'm gonna draw this one more time. I'm really glad I printed off a bunch of these because I didn't realize I was gonna have this bleed through effect going. So again, one last time, we are going to draw, I'm only gonna draw part of it. Our, no, our uh, good vol our volume, our sound, the sound we want, the green, and then I'm gonna start this. Now, remember, we want to get the noise down. So we've boosted the highs and we still have this noise, which resembles the highs in the way that they were amplified. So how do we push this down? Well, we do exactly what we did before when we were saying, well, just turn the treble down. It's exactly what Dolby does. It literally rolls the treble off, essentially. Again, we're generalizing here. So we have the high frequency we want. We have the high frequency we don't want. So now we flatten this curve, and what'll happen is it'll push the bad away. So. Now that we have this tape, this is on playback now. So let me put this as recorded, and this is on playback. So we've recorded our music in Dolby by boosting the highs. And on playback, we flip the Dolby switch, and the Dolby switch flattens out those highs back to the level they're supposed to be at. And because of this principle that we talked about, where these are locked, these relational, um, signal to noise ratio gaps, they don't change. So what happens is when we lowered this, I'm gonna do the green because that's the color it is. When we lowered this, the noise lowered at the same time. So when we lowered the high frequencies that we had boosted, it lowers the noise. So then on this scale, our noise has been lowered. That's literally it. It's an artificial boost of the highs on recording, on encoding, and an artificial flattening or lowering of the highs on playback, which, due to the laws of signal-to-noise ratio, also dictates that the noise is flattened. That's all there is to it. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, it's literally a compression or compounding algorithm. It's truly a simple thing. There's not much to it. And that's why, you know, you see off-brand noise reduction techniques. It's not rocket science. Okay, I mean, it's okay, it is science. And maybe it is rocket science. But you know what I mean. It's not the most complex thing. Now let's talk about this other little thing on here, HX Pro. What the heck is HX Pro? So we know Dolby B. And by the way, what's the difference between B and C? C does the same thing, just about twice the capability set of B. So C is double the power if you want to think of it in that regard that b is and if it doesn't say dolby c it just says dolby it's b that's the default 
Okay, so let's talk about HX Pro. That's Headroom Extension. It was actually invented by Bang & Olufsen and then licensed back to Dolby. It's not originating from Dolby, if you can believe that. Now, Dolby um, HX Pro is cool because it doesn't require decoding. If you have an HX Pro encoded tape, you don't. You can play it back on any old machine, cheap, nice, or otherwise, and you will realize the benefits of HX Pro. HX Pro is Headroom Extension. And what that means is, and I'm gonna get some more tapes here just so we have more to look at. What that means is, if we've talked about tape bias before, so tape has something called the coercivity zone, or basically what it amounts to is this. If you put sound directly onto magnetic tape, it's gonna sound like crap, unless you add a bunch of line frequency to it. We've talked about the differences between DC bias and AC bias. We're not gonna talk about it again, but essentially, when you add bias, you push the audio into the higher range of the tape, which also happens to be where the higher frequencies, the trebles are at. So sometimes without HX Pro, you get an effect where the high frequency sounds become distorted. The high frequency sounds can actually become distorted without HX Pro because they're pushed up so high into the coercivity zone by that tape bias. So all HX Pro does is lower tape bias when there's high frequencies. That's it. It lowers the tape bias when there's high frequencies on the tape, thereby preventing the high frequencies from being distorted because of the tape bias. That's a little bit harder to wrap your head around, but honestly, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, and the, finally, the last thing I wanna say, and I know we've talked a lot today, but the last thing I wanna say is one of the benefits of cheap tape decks is they have kind of a muted, rolled off quality to them on the high frequencies. So what happens is you kind of get a good sound quality off of a Dolby encoded tape playing it on a cheap tape deck. Because of the low frequency response of the head, you kind of get this roll off effect. So Dolby tapes sound decent on cheap modern tape deck. So, all right, guys, I know that's a lot to handle, but tell me down in the comments what you think. Hopefully you learned something. I sure did. Fun as always. And that's going to do it for now, guys. Happy record hunting. Happy tape hunting and listening. We will see you tomorrow.